Thank you to our sponsor, Approval Max, for making this episode possible. Approval Max is the number one tool to get bills and expenses approved quickly. It replaces paper and email approvals with automated approval workflows. Approval Max integrates with platforms such as QuickBooks Online, Xero, and Oracle NetSuite to unlock powerful efficiencies for approvers and finance teams. Stay tuned to learn more later in the episode about how Approval Max can streamline your approval workflow. If you'd like to earn CPE credit for listening to this episode, visit earmarkcpe.com. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. Continuing education has never been so easy. And now, on to the episode. And I, I look at the finance team as not like a support function, but revenue enabler. If I can make the, the, the developer, the engineering team, spend less time booking flights or doing their expense reports, that's more time that they can either be working on their actual job or recharging, spending time with their family, resting, so that, that when they do have their job, they have less on their plate. And I think about the sales team and the marketing team and the customer support team the same way. How can I take less off their plate, enable them when they interact with finance so that they can continue to do their job, level up and spend more time generating revenue for the business. That's how I usually think about things. Hey everybody, Blake Oliver here with another great episode for you. I'm talking today with David Wiesenek. Did I get that right? <laughs> you got it right, got it Wiesenek. Right. It's been a long time. It's been years since we met in person. And I always wanted to talk to you again because it's so great speaking with somebody who is at the forefront of technology in practice. Like you are using the latest accounting and fintech at startups, rapid growth startups. And so you're the person to talk to about what's working and, and what's not, especially as it relates to the future with technology. Thank you. And yeah. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. I, I definitely try to use the, the best technology. I think every salesperson comes to me and is like, hey, we have the best technology and I have to, I have to really evaluate <laughs> if that's true or not. But I also listen to you. I listen to, you know, your podcasts and your tweets because you're also pretty well up on kind of the latest and greatest. So I try to keep my, my head out there and my ears open to what there is. I then try to use it in, in, in my day-to-day -day work here now at DemoStack but in the past my other companies to make my life more efficient uh, and my team more efficient. So when we met in person years ago, you were the VP of finance at LetGo, mm -hmm. which I think at the time LetGo had raised something like a hundred million dollars and yeah. you were the VP finance there and you were still on zero for your accounting system. And you had figured out a way to scale up quite far and you were very adamant about avoiding ERP as long <laughs> as possible. And I love this, right? That, that we could take off-the-shelf accounting software and use add-ons to zero to help it scale to a, a fast growth startup. I mean, can you give us like the, how far did you take it actually? Yeah. That's my question. So when we met, that was in Hawaii, that was like 2015. And I just started VP of finance at a new startup called, called Let Go. And we had raised some money. I think at the time it was about a hundred million dollars and we had, I think four subsidiaries. And so what I did is, is I made sure that we had a common GL. Um, I looked at QuickBooks, I looked at zero. I was very experienced with NetSuite as well, but I didn't really necessarily have the budget to go out or the time to go out and purchase NetSuite at that time. So for me, we're an international company. QuickBooks wasn't really built for that. So I, I took a look, a serious look at zero. What I did is I made sure we had common GL for each subsidiary and utilized add-on tools like Expensify, like TripActions, like Bill.com, things like this to build a suite for myself, a suite of all these tools that integrated together, make sure the data is flowing for me and my team to be efficient. Now, at that time, it was really like me and maybe one other person on the team, really small. And then over the next four or five years, we grew. We raised even more money. I think um, at last count, we had raised like 500 or 600 million dollars. We were 250 people, uh, I think, no, sorry, 320 people when we merged with our competitor and doing like, I don't know, 25, 30 million dollars of, of revenue a year. 
And we were doing it on zero. We used, uh, we, we added more add-ons to the system, Carta, Approval Max, and kind of built our suite. I'm um, utilizing a core GL that was easy to use and making sure we had these add-ons that, that extended that core GL. And that kept us on that platform for a really long time and helped us extend the runway of kind of that investment we made before we moved on to something like NetSuite, which again, requires you to kind of rip out that core GL, move over. But our strategy, uh, we ended up emerging before, before we can implement the, the move to NetSuite. Our strategy was that all of these add-ons were going to continue to be put in place as we took out the core GL and replaced it with NetSuite. And the reason we did that is because all of our business users, the approvers, the CEO, the, the, the frontline managers, they could care less what core GL we're using, but they did care that their approval system and workflow was the same. The things that they touch were all of the add-ons. We can continue to use those add-ons and just replace what the accountants care about, which is the, the core GL, and nobody would be the wiser. But we would then be able to scale because we now had a more scalable system to take us to the next level, you know, from 300 to 1,000 people because QuickBooks and Zero kind of, you can't stretch it that far. And next week you can go much further and you can start thinking about an IPO with that next level of ERP. That's kind of amazing how far you took it to like, you said 300 employees or so. And that's an interesting insight. You're, the people using these systems, the non-finance and accounting people, they don't care what is running in the back end. All they want is it to be as easy as possible. And so by adding these add-ons that you felt would be best for them. Add-ons, point solutions, best of breed. You know, there's a lot of different terminology yeah. depending on what you're talking about. Yeah, we were able to really go much further because those were specifically built for that end user. While NetSuite is really more built for the accountants and not really that end user. Of course, it's, it's doable, right? But it's also going to cost a lot more money because then you need to buy more NetSuite seats, more user licenses for those specific users. And that comes at a pretty high cost. And it comes at the cost of now the system is harder to use for the end users. I think a lot of times we don't even think about the end users when we're making these purchasing decisions as finance professionals. But it is really important. It can change your relationship with the company. Totally. For me as a finance, obviously I have multiple stakeholders, but one of the key stakeholders for me is my other team members. Of course, I have the CEO and leadership team and the board and investors, but a big part of it is, is the other team, especially leaders of, of departments, right? I need their help when building budgets. I need their help when looking for cost savings together. We're going to have that collaboration. And I need to think of them as my users, like a product person would think about their users for their software. So I think about the user experience that they're having with the finance team. And part of that user experience is the tools, the finance tech stack that I build and what parts they interact with, I need to make sure I'm catering to their needs and I'm thinking about them as well. Because if I don't, I lose that trust with them. And I want them to trust me so that they come to me with questions. Hey, I need help with this negotiation. Hey, I need help with this budget. I never want them to think of the finance team as like where requests go to die that oh, I, I only say no, because I want them to come to me. I want to be collaboration. Want it to be collaborative. Part of that is thinking of them as end users and thinking about their user experience when it comes to the finance tech stack as well. Well, I want to come back to the tech stack. We can talk about that probably for hours and hours. But before <laughs> we before we nerd out more, let's talk about your current gig. So mm -hmm. right now you are VP of Finance at Demo Stack. You've been there, looks like seven months or so. Yeah, just about. And you raised a bunch of money recently, right? Yeah, so we raised, we announced this this week, a $34 million Series B lead investors from Tiger, but we all have a participation uh, from our previous investors, Bessemer, Amidi, Operator Collective, GTM Fund. So like a great bench of investors uh, to go along the journey with us. And for you, is it a very similar experience to let go? Or is this a, a different type of startup? Are you, are you using a different playbook? There's a lot of similarities. 
very similar stage of growth, right? Um, I joined, we were at Leco, we were very small. We grew to 320, very similar place here at DemoStack. Slightly different. We uh, Leco was a marketplace where a B2B SaaS product here at DemoStack. And I'm taking my learnings that I had from my time at, at OLX, my time at Leco, my time at AliPets. What did I learn from implementing? What, what are the softwares I use that I was successful at? And then applying that to today. Obviously, the decisions I'm going to make were going to be influenced from that and the tech stack decisions I make. But it's been years since I made some of those decisions. So you have to go out and say, okay, who are the new players? What has changed? Who continues to innovate? And then make really good decisions for the situation you're in because a tech stack needed for a marketplace is going to be different than a tech stack needed for B2B SaaS. Slightly different, different things, different what's most important to implement today versus tomorrow, things like that. And the vendors have changed, of course. So Letgo was a, a marketplace or is a marketplace where you can sell, buy and sell products and demo stack. Tell, tell us about demo stack. Yeah. So demo stack, we sell to other. B2B SaaS software, especially to the sales teams, but also marketing customer success. And our technology, we can clone your app. So here we're on Zencaster right now. We could basically clone all the UI of Zencaster, recreate the HTML, the CSS, all of the front end interaction, including the API calls back and forth, and then recreate that on our own servers. So as a sales team, you don't need to ask a sales engineer or developer to spin you up a demo environment for your, for your sales calls, we can basically clone your app and instantaneously create that clone where you can then present that as a demo to one or many of your prospects. And it looks and feels just like your product. It interacts just like your product. And it's a way really for you to scale your, your sales organization, but also marketing, customer success, enablement all of these other use cases that we're thinking through right now and our customers are asking for. That's brilliant because I've been a product marketer in two B2B SaaS companies now. And one of my biggest frustrations was trying to get a clean demo environment to use in my webinars and to use in my videos because we, we often start out as we're, we're sharing one demo company file mm -hmm. and then people start doing stuff to it. And suddenly the data doesn't make any sense anymore. It's just a, it's just a mess, right? People have been playing in yeah. that sandbox and now there's toys all over the place. We hear that a lot, especially yeah. from, you know, sales teams where you have a sales at 1 PM and then you have another sales calls at 2, 2 PM and you have to quickly go back and like delete everything you just did and get back to like that starting yeah. point or, um, the data is just out of date. The last time you updated that, that demo data was 2019. So all the dates are now out of date, right? What if we could keep that fresh for you, make sure your starting point is always the same place and then personalize it for each prospect they're going to get a call on, bring in the, the pictures of their CEO and CFO, bring in the names of, of prospects that are important to them because the, the, it's this industry versus that industry. And, and then do that at scale and instantly without you having to ask a sales engineer to spend three hours getting ready for that demo call. That's just not a good use of your time or their time. So yeah, I would love to have Jarev give me a call or uh, <laughs> Flowcast give me a call. I'm sure we can solve some of those problems for them pretty quickly. Yeah, I think Flowcast could really, really use you guys for sure. So what's it like being head of finance at a startup? You've been doing it for a while now. You know, because sometimes what we picture at a startup, if you know, is it's just everybody running all over the place. So many things happening, right? It's fast, fast paced environment is the... Uh, you know, job description cliche. Is it like that for you? It's definitely like that. For me, what I love about the finance role is I need to know every part of the business and what's going on. That's what financials will tell you what's going on in the business, but that's backward looking. The real important thing as a VP of finance is also looking forward and, and how do we forecast? And so I need to understand what everybody's doing in the company and how they all interact. And so that for me is, is really fascinating because I get to learn the entire business. I'm not siloed into just one little place. And then I'm here to help. I'm here to help every department purchase the software they need. I'm here to help think about pros and cons, risks and opportunities about decisions that we want to make on the product side, on the engineering side, on the people side, on the customer success side, and help them understand how it's going to impact the, the business 
and how it's going to impact the business positively and get a return on that investment down the line. So that's high level what I do. But then my job in, you know, interacts with so many different things, of course, budgeting and forecasting and finance, accounting, treasury, cash management, expenses, payroll, legal, right? Yeah. I do a bunch of HR stuff just because I have to. Do you have an HR person in the company? We do. Um, we have a small core HR team. We're looking to continue to expand that to be able to do more. We're scaling, we're growing, mm -hmm. we're hiring a lot. And so we just need more, more in the people function to help us continue to scale. We need more in every function. So if you're listening to this and you want to join a high growth startup doing really cool stuff in the B2B SaaS area, please ping me. We'll throw my email address somewhere in here for you. And you'll Hit get to use the best tech in the biz. Right. Cause yeah, I'm, that, I'm, I'm actually in the process of searching for a financial controller and, and I posted uh, it on LinkedIn and my quick pitch was like, we use the best technology, finance technology, and we'll continue to do that. Our books are clean, which is like a huge plus for anybody looking like, I which is normally a when a client tells you that it's a lie always, right? I am when, not lying. When, when David tells clean, you, you can trust me on this one, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's true. Like you're looking for a financial controller and, and yeah. everybody's like, oh, we have so much to clean up. And I'm like, I don't want to join a cleanup job. No, I want to start building. I want to build right. for the next stage. So I can, I'm promising that to anybody who joins everything <sighs> clean, we can start building. Um, sign me up. Saz, which is exciting. And, uh, we were in Israel, the U S Serbia. So pretty cool place to be now, and a good pitch. I believe that you are in your home office there. Do you work remotely? Is DemoStack a remote company? Do you travel? Like, how do you, you said that you work with all these different people in the company. Is it all on Zoom? How do you do it? Yeah, uh, it's all of the above. So at LetGo, my entire career, I've been remote and working with people internationally. At Let Go, our biggest office is in Barcelona and our go-to-market was here in the US. So I'm really used to working from afar, different time zones. So here at DemoStack, our entire US team is remote, but we have a few kind of like a little bit of a grouping and people in Austin, some in San Francisco, a few people here in New York, a few people in Denver. So we may want to get like some hubs as we grow and, and the pandemic kind of dies down. And then in Israel, we have an awesome office. I, I was just there last week. We have about 50 people in a really cool office in Tel Aviv, great view. And so I was there for two weeks working with people, um, making that human connection. We had a board meeting live in person. We had a party at the office to celebrate our new fundraising and our new brand. And it was great to make that human connection. And a bunch of us from the US side went over there. Uh, because it was our first opportunity to actually go to Israel because they were locked down for a little bit. And then in the U.S., we get together like on a quarterly basis. So back in February, we got together in Colorado um, at a ski resort. We did like a whole week of just like meeting and being together and team building. And we want to continue doing that every quarter to build that human connection. Because, yeah, we're, we're working from home. I'm working from my home office. And is that the whole U.S. company or is that your team that does that? That's the whole U.S. company. Yeah. Nice. Well, let, let's, let's go back to the technology stack for a bit. Cause I think there's probably some listeners who heard the story about zero scaling it up like that with add-ons. So I'd love to get your ideal technology stack and you know, lay it out for us on zero. And I imagine that sure. we could probably do this on QuickBooks too, right? Cause a lot of the apps will work yeah. with both. I'm going to say core GL, but it could be zero. It could be QuickBooks. It could even be next week if, if you want to make that investment early. But yeah, zero QuickBooks, a lot of the add-ons are very similar. So okay. for me, I look at tools like Ramp or Brex for corporate cards, especially P cards, purchase cards, you know, purchase software here, software there, put it on the card, need a card to, to make a hundred dollar, a thousand dollar purchase, light procurement. I usually look at those tools. Of course, you can look at Airbase. Uh, as well, or team pay is another really good option, but ramp and Brex have been making amazing strides, really investing their speed of execution and speed of, um, innovation is extremely high. And that is, those are solutions where you can provision a credit card for like everyone in the company that they can spend on, and you can control that spend with really fine grained controls. Exactly. So you get the, that control 
but you're really enabling your entire team to make smart decisions, smart purchasing decisions without bogging them down with needing to fill out a, a PO for every little thing gotcha. or always asking me for a hundred dollar purchase. No, I want to enable the team to be smart while still being in a control framework and also having that data flow right back to my GL in real time. That's really important to me as opposed to spending, you know, the end of the month going through a uh, Amex or a cap one PDF and trying to figure out who paid, who spent this and, and why what is, is it, it this amount and where's the receipt, right? You can do so much more now with ramp and Brex and team pay, all of these different tools. So you pick, pick the one that works for you. Now, what about purchase orders? You still got to have those. You said you're using approval max. Approval max is great for for POs, um, also uh, bill approvals. So you get the bill and you get the invoice in, you want to route it for approval to the right manager. Approval Max is a really good solution for that. Awesome. And yeah. so that is like, do users go in and create the POs themselves in Approval Max and then route them? Like, or Correct. do you have to so, do it? So users go in, they create a, a PO, they have an approval matrix. So you decide, you know, if it's this, or if it's this type of purchase, route it to this person for approval. If it's over this amount, route it to this person to approval. You can set up your approval matrix with tons and tons of different if then statements based on all of the data you're collecting and really set it up for your business. And so once it gets approved, if that purchase request becomes a PO, you send that PO off to the vendor and now they have that PO number, which they can put onto the invoice. So when you get that invoice, you know, two, three months later, you can do that two-way or three-way match right in approval max and know that like your purchase was pre-approved with that PO. So we got POs, we got expense reports or not expense reports, corporate credit cards. Yep. Expense if reports. Expense be... reports are important to you. Expensify for me is still number one. Great solution. They really figured out expense reports, made it super easy for the end users. If, if, if expense reports, if you're only doing one or two a month, because everybody's using, you know, ramp cards or Brex, Brex cards or travel cards, then, you know, ramp and Brex have a very lightweight expense report functionality. And you might want to just say, okay, that's enough for me. I don't need another system for Expensify. But if you're doing a bunch of expense reports, you know, then, then Expensify is a no-brainer. It's just really good. And they figured everything out. And of course. It integrates with, with your QuickBooks, with your Xero, with your NetSuite, whatever your ERP is, they have a connection for you. So then we've got AP. What do you use for that? So bill.com is tried and true, but I feel like their pace of innovation has really slowed down and their user experience is really lacking. So I've been looking at other tools. Routable is a really fantastic alternative. Ramp has a V1 of bill pay, Brex has a V1 of bill pay, Airbase uh, has bill pay. Um, and of course, in the mid market, if you have a NetSuite, you want to look at like Topalti, Mineral Tray, kind of the next step above bill.com. But for me, Routable um, is like a great middle ground between really good functionality and, and looks like it can scale as I grow into NetSuite. And payroll, who's your pick? Just works. Yes. I don't want to run my own payroll. I want a PEO to take that risk off my hand. So I always look at JustWorks PEO. It's a fantastic tool and I haven't found anything. I, I've taken a look at Gusto and Rippling. They, they both seem great, but I haven't, yeah. I, I'd rather that be a, a HR decision, not a finance decision moving over to those. Well, you have employees also in like multiple states. It is nice to have the PEO because they handle everything for you. You don't have to worry about being out of compliance with something where if you're, if you're running the payroll, they can't help you with the HR. Yeah. Uh, we went you to know? JustWorks and we can hire in all 50 states immediately. And yeah. I think that's a huge win. Huge advantage for those kind of platforms, even yeah. though they tend, to, I mean, maybe it's gotten better, but I've never had a better experience with a PEO in terms of tech than a, you know, a modern payroll company. But mm -hmm. But it's, I guess, you know, it's just worse. It's worth, in that case, it's worth putting up with a little bit slower tech for the reduction in risk and just the work you have to do from an HR standpoint. 
Exactly. Especially on the lower end. And, you know, when you yeah. get to a hundred employees, 150, definitely 200 employees, then you can start thinking about, okay, more scalable than, than, than just works a PEO. Cause then it get the, the cost benefit starts to flip on its head. Anything else? Did I miss anything major? Uh, cap table management. Carta oh, yes. is a no brainer. Um, yes. I've been on Carta now for like seven years and I don't, I don't know how I could do cap table management without it. Their education series are just really good as well for educating my team. Ironclad for contract repository and contract workflows. It's a, it's a fantastic tool and as in finance contracts are really important. So I look to Ironclad to, to solve that for me. I'm trying to think what else we, and then trip actions for travel. It's a no brainer. There's a, a few other tools out there like travel perk that, that are really good and approachable, but nobody likes to use concur anymore. So trip actions or travel perk usually get my vote. Makes sense. Yeah. So that's when your team needs to book travel instead of having them go book their own travel and then submit for reimbursement, you can do it through trip, trip actions, trip actions or no. travel perk. You can, you can put controls and your policy in the system and it's really easy to use. It feels like, a, like you would book travel on your own, what you would use for personal travel. It looks and feels just like that. So you, we get a hundred percent adoption because nobody's, everybody knows how to use it because it's just like booking travel at home, but it's all being paid centrally by the company and it's within our controls. You, you can fly premium economy. If it's over this many hours, you can fly business. If you're sea level, you know, those type of controls mm, you can yeah. put into place and enforce. And really, that's really helpful. Dave, I, I'm not going to be able to slip through my uh, business upgrade anymore because yeah. it violates policy. Yeah. At, at least it'll be flagged. I might, I might let it go uh, <laughs> for, for well, you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you to our sponsor, Approval Max, the number one tool to get bills and expenses approved quickly. Approval Max integrates with QBO, Xero, and NetSuite, so you can build an automated approval workflow without giving everyone access to the accounting system. Approval Max approvers don't need to access the general ledger and only ever see information relevant to the documents that require their approval. The approval workflows can be as complex or as simple as you need them. You can implement a variety of rules for each approval step and have as many steps as you like. For example, the marketing director approves all the marketing department's expenses. No matter how complex your approval structure is, it can be automated with Approval Max. Approvers can use the web app or mobile app to make quick and easy approvals. Approvers can even securely approve from an email notification. They just have to click the approve or reject button to make their decision. Now there's no paper and no excuse to sit on approvals. In fact, with Approval Max, 25% of bills are approved in less than two hours and 50% of bills are approved in less than one day. But Approval Max isn't just for approving bills. You can use it to create, approve, and send purchase orders to suppliers, then match those POs to vendor bills when received. You can also use Approval Max to implement a supplier onboarding and approval process, a key control to prevent fraud. If you're on zero, you can use Approval Max to route and approve sales invoices and credit notes. You can even use Approval Max to create standalone workflows for approval of any request or document beyond AP and AR. For example, you can use Approval Max to route contract approvals, proposed capital expenditures, requests for time off, and travel requests. Your team will love Approval Max, and so will your auditors. Approval Max posts a detailed audit report into the general ledger along with each approved document. Give your auditors access to all the approval workflows in read-only mode so that they can easily view and analyze your approval process. You can generate reports on documents pending approval, documents approved, and even potential fraud detected. Customers say Approval Max is a game changer that delivers improved efficiency, time savings, easier compliance, as well as data accuracy, and they're thrilled to reap the positive benefits of going paperless as a result. Learn more and sign up for a free trial of Approval Max at ApprovalMax.com. So what's different about what you're doing now at DemoStack? What have you learned from doing this at LetGo? So I think one of the biggest learnings is, is to not bite off more than you can chew. We all come into a situation and there's either a lack of 
finance tech stack, or it's outdated, or there's a ton of cleanup to do. And um, the first urge is to like do everything at once and fix everything. You only have so much time in your day. You only have so much capital, political capital, organizational capital that you have. So you kind of have to pick and choose your battles and know that you're going to solve some issues today and you're going to work towards that kind of future ideal state. And what do I mean by like political capital? I need everybody in the organization to trust me in the decisions that we make when it comes to tools and tech stack. And if I put in a process or a policy or a tool and it falls flat on its head, I lose that trust. I lose that capital within the organization. If I'm successful, I now have more capital that I can use on the next implementation, the next tool. I don't like using a carrot or a stick when I do things. I like people to gravitate to what I'm doing. And the only way to do that is to be a true leader, to build that political capital um, and to build that trust. And so for me, it's, it's making sure I pick and choose my battles. I'm smart about how we implement. I don't bite off too, too much that we can't show. And I choose vendors and technology that's going to make my life easier and their life easier. Yeah. And, and that's what I've learned. So you, you are spending political capital on picking technology and putting it in place. It's not just the cost of the software. It's also the time and energy of you and your team and the whole company. Oh, yeah. So how do you decide, how do you evaluate software vendors given all that? How do you know? Yeah. Yeah. Even if a software vendor is only, you know, only $5,000 a year, it's like, okay, but I have to spend my political capital. I have to take the time and effort to implement. That's, that's cost. That's investment that we're doing here. And so when I look at tools, of course, I'm going to look at cost and capabilities and features and what integrations they have. I want to make sure it's a good fit, but I also want to look at like the pace of innovation. Because when you buy software as a service, you're usually buying 12 or 24 months of a product. So I want to make sure, yes, it has what I need today. But even more importantly, will it have what I need and more 11 months from now when my contract's coming up for renewal? I'm purchasing 12 months worth of this software. So I need to make sure that every single month or every single quarter, they're adding new features, features and tool and, and making my life easier. So they might not have everything I need today, but will they be working towards what I need 12 months from now? So I'm looking at pace of innovation. I read release notes. I really read their support articles. I want to know what did they release last month or last quarter? And is it getting better over time? That's hugely important to me when picking software, not just the price, not just like a checklist of features but are they going to solve my problem over time and continue to, to, to solve the problems that I'm going to have as we scale? I want them to scale and, and be solving for those two. Well, speaking of problems while scaling, what is the biggest challenge that you face? Or a, it could be a specific challenge or just in general, what's the hardest part about your job? The hardest part about my job is, hmm. Probably hiring. I'm a very like tech solutions I get, implementations I get, finance, accounting I get. And hiring is, is tough. I think I'm a good manager. I've gotten a lot of good feedback from people that have worked for me and my, my team members, but it's, it's hard to find someone that, it's hard to find people that believe in the vision that you're building for the organization and want to get on board with like, building for us and for the organization and being kind of tech forward and solution oriented when it comes to like the finance team. So I want to look for people that believe in that same vision, think about finance team in the same, the same way. Yeah. Serving then, the organization, right? Yeah. 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 Not, not just doing and, a job. And I, I look at the finance team as not like a support function, but revenue enabler. If I can make the, the, the developer the engineering team spend less time booking flights or doing their expense reports. That's more time that they can either be working on their actual job or recharging, spending time with their family, resting so that, that when they do have their job, they have less on their plate. And I think about the sales team and the marketing team and the customer support team the same way. How can I take less off their plate, enable them when they interact with finance so that they can continue to do their job level up and spend more time generating revenue for the business. That's how I usually think about things. I love that because it's so different 
than how we traditionally think of accounting and finance. The idea of a cost center, I mean, accounting is the cost center. That's mm -hmm. what everyone thinks of. But you're actually saying that no, finance can generate revenue by saving yep. time of the productive people in the business. And that time's incredibly valuable. <laughs> you think about what we pay software engineers these days, they're probably the most expensive employees on the planet, right? Yeah, that's exactly how I think. Like if I can, if I can help the sales team get a, an order form out and get it through legal approval, because we've, we've, we've smartly thought about the tools we use and we smartly thought about who needs to approve at what time and what the process is, and then audit me as much as possible. They can do more deals per month. They can react to the, the, the prospect faster. They can decrease the, the, the cycle time for a contract or a sales cycle. If we can do that, then that leads to more revenue um, mm -hmm. and less cost. And like, that's, that's, all, that's all I want to do in finance. You know, more revenue, less cost happier investors, more growth for the company. Hiring's a challenge. You mentioned that, biggest challenge actually. Do you have any thing that's worked well for you? Any tips? Um, always be recruiting. Everybody's job is sales, right? Every job you do is sales. I, I, you could be an engineer, you're, 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 you're selling, right? Every job is sales and, and recruiting is definitely sales, right? So for me, it's always be selling myself, my organization, my way of thinking so that people gravitate towards that. And so when I do reach out and say, hey, I have an opportunity, you want to join, you know, got to find the right moment, of course, because not everybody's ready, you know, with their current job, right? But then, hey, yeah, I actually do want to join. I've followed you before. And so that sales process is a little bit easier when, when, when I come and approach from a recruiting perspective. So that's always be recruiting, always thinking about that. It's tough though. It's definitely tough. Well, you do have an advantage because you are offering remote work, right? That's yep. one thing that our profession still struggles with. Although I, I, I'm optimistic given like we're seeing Wall Street banks now embrace remote work. I mean, if they are going to embrace remote work, you'll think maybe accounting firms can do it. And uh, speaking of accounting firms, you got your start at PwC in Assurance, is that right? Yeah, represent uh, PwC New York, um, 300 Madison. i super grateful I did it, but man, I was not cut out to be an auditor and glad I got that experience and then found what I'm really good at, which is building an organization, helping an organization scale. Yeah, so you had to learn finance having studied accounting. I'm curious to get your take on how accountants can become finance leaders. Yeah. First of all, you have to want that. Like not every accountant wants to be on the finance side. The grass may look greener, but it's, it's different. It's different type of work. It's all, it's, it's hard as well. I definitely started out my career as more of like controller, more accounting focus. And I dabbled in the FP&A and finance side just because it was needed at my startup. And over time, I found more of a balanced approach, right? Because now I'm overseeing both accounting and finance. And I really enjoyed building forecasts and budgets and working with different department heads to think about the future and thinking about risks and opportunities and ROI about the, the strategic decisions we're making and then how that impacts the financials and then how that impacts our, our future prospects as a company. And then of course, analyzing when we get the financials from, from the accounting side, analyzing how we did against that. So you have to definitely want to do that type of work. And as accountants, I think there's, there's two things that I've done that are super important. One is extremely fast, close. I'm talking about close the books on day two, report your financials on day three. You have the rest of the month to do better job uh, of like automating and then also analyzing and helping the business make decisions. If you spend the first 20 days of the business, uh, the business month closing the books, you have really have any time to analyze. Yeah. So close the books quickly, find ways to close the books. Business day two, do a lot of pre-close work, accruals. What can you close before the end of the month? And then really spend that one first and second day doing those final close processes, consolidating, building the financials, 
handing that off to FP&A. And then that's get such, your hands, you go ahead. No, I was gonna say, that's such a great tip. Uh, like doing the accruals. Like if you know the bill is coming, just, you know, do the accrual. If it's the same expense every month. And that's not something that my accounting professors taught me. I feel like it's no. one of those things that you learn in practice to speed things up. I don't know. It's no, we, we did we did an analysis every single month, which was, and we got like 98% accuracy. Um, right. That's pretty good. That's good enough for the financials, right? right. We, would, we would basically take a look at all of the accruals that we did, and then we match it up with the invoices that came from the vendors the next month. And the difference was like 2% on, a, on average. Yeah, and I was like, that's it's great. That's good enough. And then whenever we found a vendor that was slightly off, we said, okay, well, let's look at or how we're accruing. Are we doing it based on the last three months? Are we using real data? Where are we getting the, the, the data for the accrual? And sometimes we had to change that method. But once we did, then the next month, we, we got much closer yeah. to the actual amount. But I think the key there is that you say good enough, because what are these being used for, right? The, the, the financials that you produce on day two are more valuable, way more valuable when they come out on day two versus day 20. Day 20, they're, they're useless, right? Mm -hmm. It's way too much time has passed. Everyone's done with that month. Yeah, if you can have the financials on day three, you can then make really good decisions. You have enough time to impact this month. The current that month, yeah. With decisions and, and tweaking and moving. So I like to do, I like to close the books fast, then make decisions. Sometimes you have to do like maybe a top line flash while you're closing the books. And then you get, you know, maybe it's best to say three or four where you actually get the, the books closed. But you, you can do a lot with that. And then the second thing is like automation. Oh, and so in order to do that, you need to automate. You need to right. do pre-accounting work. You need to make sure the data is flowing really well. And Real maybe time, pushing like some you that, said. Yeah, pre-accounting work down to the people that are touching it. If you have mm -hmm. to spend the end of the month asking everybody, hey, where's the receipt? What's this for? It's going to take you longer. If you can get that receipt at the moment of the transaction, what, you know, early in the month, well, then that, that's fluid. And, and all you have to do is press close, you know, yep. and you're, you're done. So you and did so the, pre the pre-accounting. And yep. you did the automation so that now you had the time as a qu controller to do all this other stuff yeah. to add value. So like, how did you learn how to do the FP&A? Did you go back to school? Did you take classes? Did you just figure it out on the job? No. Did somebody teach so you? That's the thing. That's the second part. I, I, I talked with my CFO. I talked with other experts that have done this. And I learned to build forecasts and budgets with the data that I now have. And I learned to work with department heads to say, hey, what's important to you? What helps you make good decisions? And they would tell me like, this is what I need to make a good decision. Like, okay, great. I can produce a report with that. Let's analyze it together. And now I'm learning from them what's important to them, how they think about making future decisions. So now when I go to build a forecast and a whole company forecast, I can say, okay, the marketing team looks at data like this. They're looking at CPCs, CPMs, and... They're looking at, this is how they invest to these vendors. This is how their formulas work. And now I have data that can feed into the sales team. And the sales team looks at data like this. And so now I'm starting to build my model, the way that the business actually works and how each individual department head looks at the business. So now my, my, my business model, my financial model, my forecast accurately reflects the business. So as we build a forecast two, three, five years out, it's grounded in real data, both what we have from the accounting side, then the data of how the company looks at it. We have a real live now financial model. And so that, that's how I kind of build and how I learned because I'm not a, I'm not an expert model builder. I'm not a, you know, I didn't go to a investment bank or work in a, a big fp a shop, but yeah. that's how I learned to build financial models um, based in reality. What you did there that's smart is you asked people what they wanted to see. So you, you're going to produce a model that gives them numbers that are useful, the different department heads, right, the stakeholders. And then you're also probably not making it very complicated. And I feel like that's another problem is people make these models, especially if they come from a finance, uh, like investment background, that are just insanely complicated and nobody can understand how they work or yes. update them. You right. have to keep it as simple as possible so that you can, you, you can understand what's going on. Um, yeah. But you also have to make it so that someone can open it up and understand what's going on right. there because you're not going to be at the company forever and your predecessor needs to kind of understand what you were doing and what you were thinking. And you do that within your model and how you build it. 
So one of the hot areas of accounting finance software right now is uh, forecasting, FP&A software for smaller companies. We've had this for a long time in the enterprise space, and now there's all these options out there. Are you a spreadsheet guy, Google Sheets, Excel forecaster, or are you using any tools to help you do this? Yeah, I I love what all of the new vendors are doing. There's a lot of new, vem- new vendors, including Giraffe being one of them, taking the idea of, let's say, you know, what used to be Hyperion, Oracle Hyperion, then you have like host analytics, uh, adaptive planning, and now it's called adaptive insights. And I think host analytics is called planful now, mm-hmm. right? that kind of next generation. And then you have this, this new generation of all these more approachable tools. They're all fantastic. I have not used any of them at my company, mostly because I'm very comfortable in Excel. And also our business model is changing every single month. I'm building more into it. We're, we're pivoting slightly, we're doing this. So it's, I find it really difficult and I'm, I'm going to get a lot of emails from friends in the industry. I know that are going to say like, but that's what we sell. I, I understand that. But for me, our business is moving really fast. Um, mm-hmm. and it's really hard for me to justify the investment into building out my model in these tools, knowing that it's going to change every single month. So yeah. it's just easier for me because I know Excel to build it all out in Excel. But I understand it's not as scalable that way. It's not as automated that way. But that's that's what works for me and my team. Well, I agree with you that there's a lot still to do in the FP&A software world to make it more agile. And so any product people listening right now, take David's words of advice and figure out how to make FP&A as agile as Excel. If you can do that, I bet you'll own the market. Yeah. I, I, think, I think a lot of vendors are trying to do that. They're trying, right? And it's yeah. interesting to see how it's maybe it's like five, 10 years behind what has happened in accounting software and cloud accounting, where we've got a pretty mature market now for automated accounting solutions at different stages of a company, different sizes, different needs. But the FP&A is still developing. It's very new. I mean, that's what attracted yeah. me into it personally. Well, David, this has been a really great conversation. Is there anything you'd like to add? I guess one of the questions I have to take us out is, where do you see our profession going? Like, what, what is the future of accounting and finance? Ooh, wow. That's a deep question. Are we going to be around? Are we going to get automated? Oh, no, definitely. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I would love to see a robot do this. I think we will definitely use automation to our advantage. Um, we will definitely find ways to take some of the boring stuff and the things that can be automated. It happens every single month. It happens every single day. You're seeing that now. There's so much that I can do a really small core team to provide so much value to my organization with the tools and the automation that we do. So I'm using that. I'm using the robots, but there's no robot that's going to be like, replace a David. I'm still going to need to be there to analyze, think through the business model, provide that guidance to the organization, help make those ROI decisions, help understand the risks and opportunities from a financial perspective, that's always going to be need to be there. So I love accountants. I love finance professionals. We're definitely going to be here for a long time, for sure. We're just going to make our lives easier. And that's the dream, right? Is get that close done. So we have the rest of the month to do fun analytical stuff. Or spend the rest of that month to build a bit more automations, yeah. uh, build, implement build a new re- tool. Build relationships. Build relationships. Get, exactly. Like, I, I love what you said. That, that if there's a takeaway I have from this conversation for people, it's like, get out of just doing your job and talk to the people who are using your outputs. Like, treat them like customers, really. Mm-hmm. And same thing in public accounting, where I think we have been so stuck in busy season, especially the last few years with all that's been going on, there's not been time to make improvements. So we got to figure out how do we, how do we smooth out that, that busy period? which in corporate is your close, the time it takes to close the books every month. And then in public, it's the three months that we're, where we don't accomplish anything because we're just <laughs> over, or six months sometimes, right? Uh, well, uh, I've been speaking with David Wiesenek. He is the VP of finance at DemoStack. David, where do you like to connect with people online if our listeners want to find out what you're up to and, and I think also find out about jobs? Definitely. On your team. So hit me up on LinkedIn, David Wiesnack on LinkedIn, 
or on Twitter. I'm at Dave Wees, D-A-V-E-W-E-E-Z. Hit me up on either one. I, I will respond to you immediately, for sure. Thanks again for your time and have a great uh, rest of your week. Thanks. Have a great have a great rest of the, the weekend, too. The weekend. It's, weekend. it's Friday. Yeah, We're going to go enjoy sure. our time off. Right? Enjoy. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you learned something new. And if you did, wouldn't it be nice to get some CPE credit for it? Well, I've got great news. My new app, Earmark CPE, offers free NASPA-approved CPE credits for listening to podcasts, including this one. Visit earmarkcpe.com to download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. That's earmarkcpe.com.